Hey everyone, welcome back to the DaVinci Resolve Academy. My name is Matt McCool, and this is the seventh lesson in our color series. This one's just going to be sort of a compilation of useful tips and tricks that you can apply to your color grading workflow. So these didn't really fit into any of the other lessons. They're kind of just some extra random little techniques. So let's jump right into Resolve and take a look at this first tip. Let me show you what the shot looks like here. You can see there's a little bit of camera shake. And of course you can stabilize right here on the color page or on the edit page. I'm just going to quickly stabilize the shot and now you can see it's taking care of most of that camera shake. Looks a lot smoother. Now this shot over here is very similar and let's say I want to copy over the color grade. So as soon as I do that, you can see we've copied over the grade but we've lost the stabilization. So now I'd have to re-stabilize it again. And this would actually happen if you also right click and reset your color grade. This will also reset your stabilization. So to fix this, all you have to do is come down here to the keyframe panel. And by default, this little menu here is set to all, but you also have color and sizing. So if you set this to color, now let's go ahead and stabilize this shot one more time and I'll copy over that same grade. You can see as I do that, it didn't wipe out my stabilization. And same thing if I reset my color grade, we don't reset our stabilization. So the other option here is for sizing. Now this will do everything minus the color. So if we stabilize or if we go into the sizing panel right over here, let's just say we want to maybe zoom in, tilt it up or something like this. Now if we right click and reset our grades, that will only reset our sizing as well as our stabilization, but our color stays true. Same thing if we wanted to, you know, copy over a zoom and a tilt from one shot to another. You can see now if I go to this shot and middle click, it didn't change anything with my color. All it did was paste over my sizing. So I like to have this little menu set to color by default that way. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to worry about losing any kind of stabilization or any sort of zoom, scale, pan, tilt, that kind of thing. Okay, so this next tip has to do with color density or subtractive saturation. This technique was popularized by Colin Kelly. And the way it works is you want to take your node and just right click and go down here to color space and switch this to HSV. And similar to our previous lesson on color contrast, when we switch into a non RGB color space, our red, green and blue channels switch into, in this case, hue, saturation and value. So our green channel controls saturation, but it does so in a different way than the normal saturation slider. Actually, let me show you that first. Let me reset this node here and we're back to regular RGB. You can see as these colors get more saturated, they also get brighter, kind of in an unnatural, unrealistic way. So if we right click this node and switch this into hue, saturation, value, typically what you also see people do in combination with this is come down here to the channels and disable one and three. That way you're only working with the saturation channel. I typically don't do this because you can also just keep your mouse right here on the green channel. If it helps, you can also use the color bars to do the same thing and you can just increase the green channel like this. Now, as I do this, you can see the colors are getting more saturated, but they're doing so in a much more realistic, muted kind of natural way. And so typically what you'll see people do is, let's go ahead and relabel this HSV. We can make a parallel node like this. And on this bottom one, I'm just gonna call this DSAT. And using the regular saturation, what I'm gonna do is cut that in half and just go down to 25, just to make it simple. And then in my hue saturation value node, I'm going to take my green channel and go up 1.5. And now if we take a look at our vector scope and disable this little collection of nodes, you can see the overall saturation is not really changing, but these more colorful tones here are getting more compressed and dense. And this is a very desirable look. And this is one of the simplest ways to achieve that look. But if I'm being honest, I don't particularly like having to set this up every time. And I know of course you could save this collection of nodes as a compound node, save it in your power grades, for example. But let me show you an even simpler approach to getting more color density in your saturated tones. So before I do that, I'm just gonna right click and grab a still of this so we can compare the two methods. I'm gonna delete those nodes, create a fresh one right here. And all I'm gonna do is simply go into the color warper right here. And this is kind of gonna work on a per image basis. So what I'm going to do is kind of judge by eye and kind of see where my tones are landing already. And what I typically like to do is just select maybe the first tone if it's already a really saturated image, or in this case, I think probably just these first two points out here. And then you can use this pin ring button right here 
and that will just select all the points with the same saturated level around the entire color warper. And from here, we can simply use the Luma slider. I'm just going to drag this down and also increase the saturation. And you can see as we do that, we're getting pretty much the same effect. And depending on the shot, you can even experiment with different color spaces right here. I like the HSV mode here. It tends to have a little bit of a softer touch on skin tones and things like that. So here it is before, here it is with the color warper. And if I slide between these two, you can see on the right side, we have the HSV method. And it might be kind of hard to see. I'm trying to look at the skin tone here, but they are very, very similar. There might be a little bit of a difference right here in the red part of the hat. But honestly, I prefer the color warper method just because it's simpler to use. It takes one node and I don't have to remember to change a color space or disable any kind of channels, nothing like that. And all the controls are right here inside of one node. Rather than adjusting the regular saturation in RGB and going back to the HSV node and adjusting the green channel or the saturation channel, you're kind of hopping back and forth between two different nodes. Whereas with this simpler approach, you're inside one node and you have both controls right here. So we can easily adjust our overall saturation, take down the luminance, and we're already set up to adjust independent tones if we need to. So for example, I could select maybe just one dot right here and using the column button, this will select the other points along that same axis. I could shift the hue around and get a lot more use out of a single node rather than kind of hopping around using two different nodes in a parallel structure that basically just accomplish one broad task. So for me, I just prefer this method, but you know, you can experiment with different ones and figure out which one's going to work best for the specific project. But the color warper is extremely powerful and it's honestly really useful for all kinds of look development tasks. Okay, so this next tip also has to do with the color warper, but instead of looking at this hue and saturation grid on this side, I'm going to hop over here to the Luma grids. So right here, you can see we've got two separate grids. This one represents kind of like our white balance luminance levels, and this is kind of like our tint luminance. So I have two little tips for using these grids. The first is kind of a nice way to add a unique color contrast to your footage. So what I like to do is come over here and select the push points icon right here. And looking at my histogram right here, what I'm going to do is pick a point that's kind of dense not at the very, very bottom, but maybe right here. And I'm just going to click one time in this little box. You can see that pushes my points out away from my mouse. And I'm just going to do the same thing on my white balance grid over here. Now you can see with those two simple clicks, we've added this nice punchy contrast to our image and it doesn't look like it's falling apart in an unnatural way at all. And same as the other color warper tip, we might want to switch this to HSV. And that gives us a little bit of a softer touch on the skin tone areas. So just a really easy way to add a little bit extra contrast to your footage. Now another technique I like to use with the color warper while we're looking at these luma grids, what I like to do sometimes is select the very top middle point right here and come over here and pin that point. And then I'm going to hold control or command on the Mac and just select these outer and upper points right here on the edges. And using my luma slider right down here, I'm just going to slowly drag these down a bit. And you can see what that's doing to my foliage. It's making it look nice and muted. Okay, now let's do the same thing on our green and magenta. So I'm gonna pin that center upper point in the middle, hold control, grab these outer points, just pull that luma down about right here. Now you can see with those minimal adjustments, I think we've got this really beautiful, lush and cinematic contrast. And yeah, this is just a really simple way to add a little bit more contrast and look to your footage. Okay, so this next tip has to do with the highlight mode. So something that you might do often is use like a power window, for example, and kind of grab a portion of the skin and turn on your highlight mode like this, just to make sure on your vector scope that your skin is landing where you want it to. But the problem with the highlight mode, as soon as you click to a different node, let's say you want to adjust your balance or your exposure, but view the highlight, it won't let you do that. It'll just show you whatever node is selected. So there is a way around this. What I'm going to do is go back to this node that I'm currently using as sort of my skin checker, and I'm going to turn a highlight mode off. And what I'll do instead is invert this power window here and just turn the gain really low like this. Now this essentially works exactly the same. 
it just turns the outside of the window black instead of gray. But you can see here on my vector scope, I've got the same information displayed. And now I can click away to these other nodes and make any kind of fine tune adjustments just like this. Now this works fine for the current setup I have everything here on one page. But what if we have, instead of having our Rec 709 and our look, everything here on the clips panel, what if we instead use the timeline section right here? I'm just going to add a node, paste in our Rec 709 LUT. And just for this demonstration, I'm going to output to Cineon Log and use one of the built-in film LUTs in Resolve that accepts a Cineon Log input. Okay, so now we've got a look applied to our footage here on the timeline area. Now, same thing as before, I'm going to use a node after my look and just turn on my highlight mode. Let's restrict this to the skin tone area like this. Now, again, we can't really go to a different node and keep our highlight mode on, right? But we could do that same trick. Instead of using highlight, we could invert that power window and turn the gain all the way down. But the problem with this is we have to constantly jump back and forth between the timeline area and our clips area. The same would be true if we also had a group post clip for our look. So here's a neat little trick to get around this. Let me just go ahead and turn my gain even lower so it's basically all black. So what you can do is actually save this skin checker node as a shared node. Let me go ahead and relabel this skin. And then over in my clips area, I'm just going to right click, add node, add this skin checker node. And now we basically have a toggle on the clips panel where we can turn this on and off and make sure our skin is still landing where we want. We can go to a different clip here. I've got two Rec 709 conversions, so let me just disable this last node here. And same thing, I'm going to add this shared node here and make sure we have this unlocked. And now you can see I can move this anywhere I want to and do this on a shot by shot basis and make sure my skin is living where I want to. And now I can freely click around and adjust different nodes without having to lose that highlight. And the cool thing about this is you can even increase the gain a little bit if you want to have a little bit of the background show beneath, but mostly have the portion of the power window that you're using to check your skin. So that's kind of a cool little trick that I use from time to time if I have my look over here in a different area. Now you could also use the same technique to basically create a toggle for your look. So let me just show you really quick if I delete that node and I'm just going to create a layer mixer and I'll just grab another output from this source and feed it directly into this node here. And I'm just going to go ahead and put on another color space transform. This time we're going to go straight into Rec 709 Gamma 2.4. So essentially with this setup, currently we are bypassing these two nodes which are responsible for the look. So if we turn this off, we're now looking at the LUT. If we turn it on, we're looking at just our simple Rec 709 conversion. Let's go ahead and label this Rec 709. And we save this as a shared node. We can go over here to the clips panel. Let me delete the skin checker, right click, add a new node. This time I'm gonna add my Rec 709 shared node. And now I can turn this on and off. And I basically have a toggle on my clips section that will disable or enable my look. So now I can easily toggle between my log image, my Rec 709 color grade, and my look. And I can do the same thing on this shot because I've got this set up over here on my timeline area, which will impact all of the shots on my timeline. So if I right click, add node, add my Rec 709 node, now you can see we've got the same look toggle right here on the clips panel on this shot as well. Okay, so for this next tip, I actually want to hop over here to the Fusion page and show you a scenario that I've got set up right here. So I've 3D tracked this scene here and placed some text behind the trees and behind our actor that walks across the frame. Now for a comp like this, it really does need to be integrated all inside of the same footage, right? So there's a few different ways that we can handle the color process for a comp like this. Now, sometimes you might want to bring your title asset and your footage into a common working space right inside of Fusion, maybe output to DaVinci Wide Intermediate like we discussed in our color management lesson. And then from there, you could hop over here to the color page and everything would be coming in as DaVinci Wide Intermediate and you would treat the entire comp as a complete frame. Now, this is actually why the Fusion page comes before the color page, because this is the intended workflow for most compositing tasks. 
but sometimes you don't necessarily want to treat your title and your footage the same way. Maybe you want to have different color for your title and your footage, but it has to be contained on one comp like this. What we're going to do is really simple here. So this final merge right here, this is actually what merges the title over the footage. So what I'm going to do is just simply delete that merge node. And this blur node is actually just going to blur our footage. You can see if I have that merge back, this blur is just kind of blurring where the text shows through. So we can leave this blur just as it is because we're going to treat all of these colors the same way we're going to treat the rest of the footage. All I'm going to do is simply add another media out node right after this final node here that creates our title. And if we view that media out, you can see just the title by itself. And if we scrub through here, we can even see the cutout of our actor. We can see the tree branches and everything is being masked because our footage is going through this magic mask right here, which is cutting the render nodes of the titles. And so we've got two different media out nodes. And if you click on each of these and you look in the inspector, you will see an index number. So the first media out node will always start at index zero. And whenever you add more media out nodes, this index increases. And so what this index number refers to is actually these source inputs right here on the color page. So if we want to bring our title together with our footage, all we have to do is right click in the empty area and click add source. And now we get a new media source. And this refers to that index one. You can even hover over it and it says media out two. This one will say media out one. And so to actually use it and to bring it in with this footage, we're going to go to the very end of our node tree and just add a layer mixer. But instead of taking an output from the previous node, I'm just going to grab an output from this source here. Now, this is what will happen immediately. We get a black background instead of the footage shining through. So all we need to do is grab another output from our source, feed that into the mask of this node here. And now you can see everything looks the way it should. And we have two separate color streams going on. So up here, we can independently adjust the colors in our footage without impacting the title. So now you can see if I scrub to the very beginning of this comp and take a look at those glows, those specular highlights are exactly where they should be. They have not been affected by this dramatic exposure drop. Same thing if I were to increase this, you can see we're only impacting the footage. So we could really treat this however we want. We could do some balance adjustments without impacting our title. And kind of the other way around, I could even come down here and start to treat my title separate from the footage. You can see now I can shift the hue around of my title if I wanted to change the color after the fact. It's very easy to do that. So you can do all the normal color corrections you would normally be able to do on your footage, except now you have two separate color streams going on. And if you wanted to add additional nodes, you can see if I add another node here, we get our black background back again. So all you have to do is reconnect the mask. And every time you add a node, you'll just want to connect that mask output like this. So kind of a cool way to combine fusion graphics with footage and treat them together all in one clip so that on the edit page, everything is condensed together, but you still have independent control over your fusion graphics and your footage. So that's pretty much all the tips and tricks I have for you today. I hope you got something out of this. And of course, there's other tips and tricks in all the other lessons. So if you haven't watched all the other lessons, go back and check those out. Next week, we are doing an entire color grading workflow from start to finish. So I hope you look forward to that. Thank you for watching and we will see you next time.